system is connected. Hello? Hello? Hello, hello everyone. Thank you very much uh, for coming. And uh, actually, it's very interesting that um, a question that was posed by, by Paul at the end of the previous session from the Dynamic Coalition on Community Connectivity is going gonna, is gonna to be the, the answer. The answer is going to be somehow discussed in this um, whole uh, whole session on um, on, a, on a paper. Well, the, 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 the session is about discussing a spectrum and, and uh, as a resource that community networks and other small scale operators are requiring to, to grow, to scale, to establish, to emerge. Um, and it's based in, in, uh, in some work that um, the Internet Society, together with uh, Mozilla and the Association for Progressive Communications, has supported. Um, and it will be introduced by, by Steve Song. And then we have a set of uh, panelists uh, here from, well, they will introduce themselves, or Jane will introduce them, uh, that will uh, give their opinion on the on the paper. I believe most of you have read it. It was circulated uh, within the Internet Society lists for quite some time, and it received quite significant amount of comments that were incorporated in the final version. Uh, we are expecting it to be released at the end of the month, and, um, but we can send it to anyone who is interested in their current version just now. And uh, after, after that, first initial comments from the, from the panelists, uh, we will going to questions and answers. We have some prepared. I mean, uh, Jane has done an amazing job on uh, creating the whole framework for the session. And, uh, and then open to, to all of you to other questions that you, you may have. Um, except for Jane, she's one of the moderators and not necessarily a panelist. It looks like a manet to me. And uh, I feel extremely ashamed for that. Uh, we have tried received three cancellations in the last week from women that were going to participate in, in this panel, but I think it's not that many women in regulatory spaces and that we, yeah, we, we should reflect about that and, 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 and what is the impact that it has in these discussions. Anyway, over to you. Okay. So I think before introducing the panel, well, I will introduce the panelists, Steve Song. Um, from NSRC and also a uh, Mozilla Fellow, is one of the core authors of the paper that Carlos just mentioned. The paper is up on our website and we'll try and circulate that link on Twitter a little later and happily send it to anyone that would like it here. Um, next is Mokhtar Yadali, who is with the African Union, and each of you can quickly say more about who you are, because I'm going to go fast through this. Uh, Mokhtar has been a great partner of the Internet Societies, both on Internet Exchange Point's core Internet infrastructure, and has w recently helped us host a very uh, big meeting in Addis with other regional and regulatory entities, with APC and others, to talk about the importance of community networks. Um, to my right is Augustine Garzan from the ENACOM, which is a regulator in Argentina. He will talk more about what he does in a sec. Deepak, whose last name I always make a mistake on, so he's going to tell you his last name. Uh, <laughs> Deepak is with Symantec, but is here through IEEE. Eric Huerta is with Redes Comunica, a key organization in Mexico that's been helping move the ball forward with regulation, policy, development, and works closely with Raiza Marica with Peter, who's here. Bob Pepper, who many of you know, probably doesn't need much introduction, but he's an old friend from uh, Washington, D.C. He's been with Cisco, the FCC, and currently is with Facebook. So without more ado, I'm going to turn over to Steve. And I just should say we are being live streamed. So please don't talk as fast as I am. And, um, and I do want to address Carlos's point. We did try and have more women. We've had the cancellations. There are some fabulous people we are working with around the world, but um, we do need more people to understand Spectrum as well, which is part of the objective of the paper. Steve, over to you. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to try and explain why everyone should care more about Spectrum. And uh, it's a difficult one because mostly when people start talking about spectrum policy, you can see eyes roll up into people's heads. So I, I think the, the, um, the underlying premise here, why, why this is important, 
is that access has simply become too valuable to exclude anybody. Right? We've talked about strategies to, you know, you see broadband strategies with 80% coverage. But now, you know, these devices are so useful socially, economically, culturally, that, um, and they get better every day, uh, that simply by standing still, um, those without access are being left further and further behind. So we need strategies to connect everyone. And the evidence is growing now that current access models um, traditional sort of monolithic operators are going to cover a large percentage of the population, but they're not going to connect everyone. And so alternatives are needed. And the, the two keys to access, um, are one is, is, is fiber and backhaul infrastructure, and that's another <laughs> conference. Um, but the other one is access to wireless spectrum. And that uh, is emerging as a greater and greater problem in terms of access because it has become more valuable. And as it has become more valuable, it's become more expensive as the model for allocating spectrum in the world has been a sort of traditional real estate model. You know, you put it up for sale. and. Uh, and now, I mean, the, the price is being paid for spectrum, for long-term licenses, um, have the unfortunate side effect of placing a giant wall around the market. So you have virtually no market permeability, especially in emerging markets. So, uh, you know, if there's a $50 million barrier to, to entering the market, to doing anything, suddenly you, you have a serious problem. And the paper that we wrote was, uh, was attempt, attempts to really sort of lay out some of the innovations that are addressing those challenges of the current sort of dominant model of how Spectrum is made available and looks into innovations ranging from shared spectrum strategies to dynamic spectrum to spectrum set-asides and uh, tries to paint a picture of uh, a more holistic regulatory framework for making spectrum um, uh, accessible to all. So with that, I'll, I'll stop there and, uh, and hand over. Thank you very much. Um, that was Steve Sung, who is a Mozilla Fellow and also with NSRC. Um, Steve is the author and also creator of Village Telco, so he's a person to talk to about starting from the ground up as well. Mukhtar, um, the paper that Steve just described and we put out describes the, the complications from a regulatory and policy perspective. Can you highlight for us, um, whether it's your perspective from the paper or as someone who's critical in the African Union, what you're seeing and how you could, um, your perspective. Well, thank you very much. And uh, again, my name is Mokhtar. I'm the head of uh, Information Society within the African Union Commission. And I must say that the issue of spectrum is one of the complicated things, specifically for those who pretend to be engineers like me. Uh, now, uh, one of the, uh, I, I read the paper uh, very well, and uh, I, it actually, it's, it's, it's a wonderful paper. One of my first comment on it is, uh, I do agree with you on the fact that, first of all, how you set the, the <coughs> issue itself, how to frame it was actually very well, the issue was very well framed for the need of spectrum and communication and so the pricing issue, uh, all that. Uh, and I agree with you that the fact it, it should be made very accessible to everybody, not, not everyone understand what is really spectrum. The function what we call the engine is the allocation of the spectrum, which is the function of space, time, and services, uh, with implication of the different type of modulations and so on and access, is very important for everybody to understand what it is all about. Um, having said that from technical point of view, uh, the issue of transparency in uh, uh, allocation, the, uh, the fact that uh, the inappropriate rules of awarding the spectrum to different services and so on. The unpredictability, because sometimes, you know, most of the regulators stay slip on the, the fact that uh, they uh, send rumor that they would be allocating some part of the spectrum, but they slip on it for five, six years, and the operators are waiting to see how it's going to happen. The fact that um, the annual fees are not set really properly, uh, the combination between uh, do I have to squeeze the maximum possible money from the spectrum and forgetting about the fact that uh, that could, as he said, uh, 
really stop uh, services to be developed. Uh, the renewal, because sometimes people get uh, allocation and they stay uh, for five, six years, or even ten years waiting for the renewable to be announced. And so on. those issues probably are the things that will be, uh, should be highlighted uh, on this document. And I will uh, later on make some specific recommendation on how to approve this kind of thing. And I start here at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Maktar. Um, Pepper, I'm going to come over to you. You were a regulator. Um, and having taken a look at the paper, what else would you suggest about set-asides for rural, remote, and underserved areas uh, with respect to spectrum? So, um, first of all, I just want to recognize, so, um, one of the real spectrum experts here is Dale Hatfield, who's in the back, who I didn't realize that Dale was going to be here. So, this is, this is great, right? Um, uh, so, and also, what I, what's terrific is that there's a standing room only, in a room talking about spectrum. Spectrum is cool, um, right? And so, Steve, you know, it's like, it roll, for the people here, the eyes don't roll. This is like the cool, this is, these are the cool kids, right? Right? Because without spectrum, nothing's going to happen, right? And you're absolutely right. There are these two gating factors to be able to have mobile broadband everywhere, and that's how the world is going to be connected. How do we connect the three and a half billion people who are not connected? There's three and a half billion people connected. It's going to be radio to the device, right? So this is absolutely essential. Um, so, uh, you know, I used to joke when I was at the FCC doing spectrum policy, I said there's, there's three, three essential aspects of spectrum policy. One is flexibility, the second is flexibility, and the third is flexibility. Um, and what I meant by that was that, number one, um, if you genuinely want to be technology neutral, which you need to be, right? And this goes to the point about crazy excess payments. Um, you know, there don't have a, a license for 2G and then require, I have to go back to Mother May I to ask permission or get additional different spectrum for 3G and then go back for 4G. It's a spectrum license, right? And, um, uh, you know, if, 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 you're not, tech, you're not technology neutral if you say to the operators, and by the way, this creates artificial scarcity, which increases the cost, increases the price of spectrum. So if you say to operators, yes, you have a 2G license, but you're not permitted to use that and innovate to deploy the next generation technology, and you have to go back and pay government a, 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 a toll fee before you can do that, all right, that's the wrong incentive structure. All right, so that's number one. Number two, uh, that's the, the, the flexibility on the, the, the second is flexibility of the service and what you can do with it. Um, and then third is the flexibility to be able to transfer licenses to actually have the market correction so that if in fact um, you want to exit the business, you have the ability to do that and you can have a restructuring. Now there's a third piece of this which I would argue is, that, you know, now what we've learned is really maybe a fourth flexibility, which is the whole notion of dynamic spectrum and dynamic spectrum access. Um, one of the things that, that we've learned is that there's spectrum that's been allocated, right, but it's not been assigned. And so what you, we really need is the ability to have op, opportunistic use of spectrum that is not being used, right? And then again, because what we should be doing is having a goal of more spectrum, you know, driving the unit cost down, um, do not create artificial scarcity, um, and actually we need more spectrum out there to be used. Um, now that's really sort of, t t most of what I've just said is related to to licensed, but we have to have more, in addition, much more unlicensed spectrum or licensed exempt spectrum for all kinds of new services. So what some of the things that, that we're working on uh, and that we've been advocating for is next generation Wi-Fi at six gigahertz, all right? Um, the FCC is opening up, just opened up a, a big proceeding to, to make available a lot more spectrum. Again, eliminate scarcity. Um, up at the very high frequencies at 60 gigahertz, um, uh, the V-band uh, for uh, small cell meshing. Um, again, um, most countries and parts of the world have that as unlicensed. Unfortunately, some countries, including India, have it as licensed. 
uh, for part of it, and that's preventing the spectrum from being used. Um, and then also some of the things that Steve, you know, we've worked on together is open cellular um, and using spectrum for, because what you want to do is take advantage of existing devices that are in the market and low cost. And the question is, how do you opportunistically get access to spectrum where it's not being used in order to be able to have service to where it has not yet been built out by the traditional, by the traditional operators? Last point is a lot of this is, is regulatory. Uh, in Peru, uh, the government um, looked at rural areas and said, you know, they've tried all kinds of things, satellites and whatever. Um, it has not worked. So they created a new legal structure called RMIO, Rural Mobile Infrastructure Operator, um, that essentially would be a wholesale radio access network that any operator could then attach to at the edge with their own, you know, um, BTSs or, or spectrum, or, or, or to use that spectrum. And that's another way of sharing spectrum um, in, in, different, in a different way. And we're partnering with Telefonica uh, in that wholesale radio access network that will enable multiple operators to serve parts of rural Peru that today are not served. So multiple things, but all goes back to spectrum, and spectrum is cool. I'm going to jump over to Augustin. Um, the paper we, uh, that Steve, Pepper, and others have just sort of talked broadly about does discuss the important role of government. You are with government. Can you explain what you've done recently in Argentina to try and help community networks? Yes. Uh, well, f first, first uh, I, sorry for my bad English. I will try. Um, I agree with all Robert say and uh, what they say about the B flexibility. I, I like to think that we are open mind to get to internet to every part of the country. Um, we have a very big country, it's, a, it's number seven in size and number 32 in population, so it's very difficult to get internet to, to everybody. So uh, we work with the uh, universal service, getting with satellite internet in some places. We, a few months ago, we re make a new regulation for community networks to, they can get the free, a free license to, to start work operating. And I agree that the spectrum is, uh, with the price, you have a, a, a difficult for the s small operators. So that's a big issue to resolve. Um, but again, we, um, you, we think we have to, uh, you have to have as a, as a government uh, all, all kind of solutions uh, to get to everywhere. You can get to, to everywhere, uh, everywhere with satellite internet. You can go everywhere with uh, community networks. You have to be open mind and get uh, each place with the best alternative to connect everybody. But I agree that uh, every year is more uh, difficult to be unconnect because all is more co all this all this uh, government service, the education, all. Uh, every year it's more, co uh, it's more important to be connected. So it's very bad if you are not connected. Um, well, that's uh, a part of our work in, in Argentine. Excellent. Thank you very much. I'm going to jump over to Eric Huerta now, who has had a great deal of experience um, dealing with spectrum-related issues in Mexico. From the paper's perspective, Eric, and what Pepper was just talking about, you know, August and flexibility, issues related to 2G, can you use that same license to go up to 3? Over to you. Well, I've, I've found uh, um, the study great, and I, I like it a lot, and, then, and I think I really recommend it because it's, it's simple, no? Even it's, it, treats, uh, it, it talks about a complex thing, it's very simple in the way it's it, uh, 
it's done. And I just want to <clears throat> highlight some some things on, on the on this issue. No? So we have to see that the traditional way the spectrum has been regulated was not based on the nature of a spectrum, that the nature of a spectrum is flexible. It was, it was uh, regulated about the uh, nature of the equipment that was in, in those days, uh, no? and those equipment was a silly equipment, was very hard to modulate, so you have to give them, guarantee them some space so that they could work and not interfere each other. But that's not because of the spectrum, and it's because of, of, the, of the equipment. And, but, uh, but we have lost our mind, and we have just sometimes, I mean, I, I see all the time that people, when they start talking about the spectrum, start talking about the scarcity of the spectrum. The spectrum is a scarce resource. That's when, always, when it comes to, uh, to speech about the spectrum, someone says it's a scarce resource. Please, the next time you see someone saying that, say, no, it's not. No? The spectrum is not a scarce resource. Spectrum, uh, it's, if we do this, uh, have, can stand a very high number of combinations between, um, um, between, um, between time and place. No? And without, with those combinations could be really flexible, it's, it's not actually scarce. And uh, so, and so, but what is really important in the spectrum is to use it, is to be used efficiently. And so how do we, um, how can we regulate the spectrum so that it could be uh, efficient and we do efficient use of it? And uh, it's, it's to allocate this thing of time and place regarding the, nat the nature of the service and the technology available for that. So, if we take into account this nature of the service and the technology that is behind and its use, then we can come to many possibilities. And I find like there are three ways that we could, regarding the spectrum, um, to to organize the, its use. And, and one is like a schedule. No? I mean, if we think in, in roads, no? if, we're, if we're going to use that road for races, we actually need some exclusivity because if someone crosses the road, that we will, will be run over. No? So we certainly have to say, OK, you will use it from this time to this time in this certain place and in an exclusive manner because someone may crash. But if we gonna be transit and people will be running that maybe we, we will need a sign out. No, we would need a red light, a green light and people could pass through those. But uh, if there is a path and there's no many cars crossing and that, maybe just we need some rules of behavior, some politeness and say, okay, just <laughs> so, and, uh, when you see a person crossing in the zebra, please stop and let the person cross and, and that's the thing. So with these two, three criteria, I think we can use a spectrum. No? For instance, uh, if there is, like a, I need broadcasting, no? probably in certain area and there's a broadcaster there can use the spectrum and will use it, use it in exclusivity. But if, what is it a link or a TP link? No, that it it goes. It doesn't go like uh, over, but it goes in just one direction. So we can put many persons using that at different times, and that's that's a thing. Or or a Wi-Fi. No, it's just a protocol and say, okay, you go first, you, <laughs> and they, they organize themselves. So and this, I think this is the challenge for the regulator. Try to start regulating different the way spectrum it's, it's regulated. It's, it's no more, uh, it's, it, if we do it in the same way we have been doing that, we are um, avoiding people to get connected. And the important thing of the spectrum is to be in use. You know? Okay, I was saying, Jane, that I have a question for all the panel. Because, uh, yes, very interesting. We all agree everyone needs more spectrum. That's the next thing that we need to actually connect the unconnected. Yet, 
most of us have been advocating in different countries, and maybe I'm going to put the two of you on the spot here from a more government and policy perspective, to get more spectrum. In the case of South Africa, we've been advocating for six years. Yes, yes, we need to do this, we need to do that. But it doesn't get concrete. Like, and then this paper is going to be out, we are going to be discussing about this, it will die out. What are the steps that are required? We participate in every public consultation, we go to every process, we engage with regulators in training, we do, like, what is missing there? You know, what, if everyone agrees, what, what, what do we need to do? Because it seems obvious, I mean, everyone agrees. So, so what, what, what is the ma magic uh, recipe for making this happen? Is that a question to me? <laughs> well, uh, there is no uh, uh, mathematical equation. So it's just a matter of, uh, I think, traditionally, as uh, everybody said, specifically in the developing world, is uh, spectrum is a source of revenue. That's simple. And uh, you give it to the highest bidder. And that's exactly what is uh, stopping things to happen. And therefore, in order to just to avoid these kind of things, we need to uh, review our strategy for the universal access. Uh, if you go to the example of Africa, for instance, uh, half of the world is connected. Africa is still below 40%. However, 60% of the population is still in the rural areas and they don't have access. So it's very easy to say that probably connectivity is provided to the people who are living in the urban areas rather than the people living in the remote and rural areas. It's very, very, very easy to draw that. Our concern as African Union Commission, uh, which is an organization, intergovernmental organization, is to provide access to everybody. And this is holistic approach. It's not only about spectrum itself. It's about all basic infrastructure. Our approach for development is first electrifications, then digitalization, which is actually ac provide access to everybody. And then, of course, freedom, democracy to, uh, to, to, to everybody. Um, we have uh, come to the conclusion that this vertical way of thinking, that thinking that the government and the top people has to, the one who has to provide access need to is absolute now. It doesn't work. The universal access fund didn't work very well. So we need to go for more horizontal approach and therefore the community access is very important. And we, the African Union, are willing to support. We have hosted, as you, you mentioned, uh, and it's a historical moment because uh, in the premises of the African Union, you see the uh, ISOC chapters meeting and discussing the community issues and shutdowns. Uh, I beg you. Uh, we plan and we are working with uh, the community to make sure that that declaration on uh, community network would be uh, adopted as we adopted the declaration of internet governance and digital development of the digital economy thanks to the community and we'll continue to do that. So it's, it's not really now the typical government approach of uh, uh, top-down uh, vertical approach and so on but rather uh, involving the community, the basis to make sure that we are providing access to everybody. Yeah. And mind you, would be willing to work with Facebook, and Pepe, I'm making you an offer now, uh, with Google, for those who are coming with original ideas of access to everybody, and therefore, the spectrum will have to go with that kind of things, because if a new approach is for access coming, a new approach for spectrum, and uh, I think Steve has mentioned very well, we need to have a new thinking of how to uh, effectively manage spectrum. But we are at your disposal. Thank you. I would also say that if the return on investment, if the spectrum costs are so high and the return on investment is that there's still half the population of the world isn't connected, we know from GSMA that for some of the current mobile operators that for communities of five to 3,000 and under, there's no return on investment for traditional operators. So are we looking at something where we're talking about like a social impact investment contra uh, pact where we start as companies, government, civil society, technical community, companies like Deepak's at Symantec, the governments, to say, okay, if this amount of spectrum could be set aside for rural, remote, and urban underserved, can that help? Now, we recently, you changed a regulation, um, Augustin, in Argentina um, how did you do that? Because it's really important to get to the how, and I'm going to ask Steve and Deepak the how in a minute, 
because Steve has some interesting ideas on new regulatory focus, because the current regime, I'm just going to say this, and Raul, close your ears, um, <laughs> it's not working. Let's be honest, I've been doing this for 20 years, <laughs> so, uh, or more maybe, but the current regulatory models are just not helping get to the indigenous communities. I'm looking at Matt when I say this. Ucha knows, who's from Georgia, who's sitting behind me in the project that we've been working on um, in Georgia with our colleague Marit. Um, the government of Georgia is putting money in from an economic perspective, from the Economic Development Fund. So we have a regulator and others in Argentina that are making those changes. So how did you do it? Um, our success as regulator is not to collect money for a spectrum, it's, it's to connect people. Uh, that is a first issue to, to think about it. Nobody will congratulate us to collect a lot of money for the spectrum. Um, but also we know that it's a, a very expensive because the re revenue that generate all in the big cities uh, after uh, sorry to, uh, um, Recently, we we make are, are making proof with um, white spaces, and recently we uh, make um, put the four four hundred band to rural areas. Uh, we have um, with li from from little ESPs and uh, cooperative ESPs, ESPs. Um, asking for more than 2,000 small towns to use that spectrum. And it will be um, like a beauty contest between them, but it's going to be very cheap. And we um, are installing the ecosystem to that band, but we think it's a good solution to start uh, use spectrum to collect rural areas. Deepak, as a company, I know you're not a mobile company, but and also with IEEE, what would you say rural India needs connectivity? How would you talk to the government about changing spectrum policy? Thanks, Ian. So number one, uh, we should realize, as Eric mentioned, uh, and uh, there was a reference to this phrase resource, the fact is that radio spectrum is perhaps the only, and I'm repeating it, the only natural resource that every country has been endowed with the same amount, okay? So somebody has got more land, somebody's got more air, more sunlight, etc. But this is the only resource that every country has at the same amount, okay? That's one thing. The second thing is, when we are looking at spectrum, like Eric just mentioned, that yes, you may need some lanes and some other things, but the fact is you also need some footpaths. You also need some uh, uh, common areas where uh, nobody has to need anything. So I remember when I was in school, uh, those days, uh, uh, about 40 years back in India, you need a token for cycle, bicycles, okay? There used to be a license even for radio sets, just the transistor sets, by the way, okay, the rece receiver sets. And that was also the case even in the U.S. long back, the uh, bicycles, the radio sets, etc., and many other places, and those licenses slowly have gone away. 17 years back, uh, I wrote in November only in 2001 that about Wi-Fi and why do we need li license-free spectrum in India, and people were upset about it. Uh, I mean, Wi-Fi, of course, came back in 1998. Now, one of the other things about Wi-Fi was that it uses frequency hopping technology. And at that point of time in India, frequency hopping technology itself was not allowed. So there's a different issue with what, whether you need a license, whether, what you have to pay, etc. but frequency hopping, it's, Technology itself was not allowed, and the reason were purportedly around security. So it took a lot of time and efforts for us to come around that, and it didn't happen in one single shot. So in 2003, the first regulation came, which said that you could use these things in low power only in building, so for example, within this building, or only in a particular campus, let's say a particular university or something like that. Then in 2004, we got a little bit more flexibility, and it became only in 2005 that it was fully de-licensed in the 2.4 to 2.4, 83.5 megahertz ISM band. Later, of course, the government has also de-licensed many of the other bands uh, for RFID, and uh, even in 5 gigahertz, now there's 
delicensing. And there, of course, as Bob just mentioned, uh, there's a need for many more bands, and that's something which is still work in progress. In many cases, yes, the challenges are allocation, no assignment, assignment, no usage, or very, very low usage. So that's why you do need more flexibility to leverage many of these type of uh, uh, technologies, and especially with the online databases currently that we have, we should be able to do many of these type of things, including white spaces, for example. I talked about white spaces almost a decade back in the country uh, discussion around that. So th that's one area around uh, these things, that many times the apprehensions are so uh, <coughs> well set in the mindset that people are not open and willing, and that's why it is important for them to show some small successes, especially I would say start with maybe a, a mesh network, maybe with a uh, control environment where is one campus so they know who the users are, etc., and then slowly look at how do you pitch away and uh, chisel away these regulations in phases one by one. The other thing is we are right now at UNESCO, and just very close to this is the Eiffel Tower. Now, Eiffel Tower, of course, opened on 6th May 1889, but on 5th November 1998, as 1898, 120 years back and a week back, uh, Eiffel Tower, the maker of Eiffel Tower actually did a wireless transmission from there to Pantheon. And that was one of the ways that the Eiffel Tower is still there, because originally it was licensed only for 20 years. And because it started using wireless, uh, they, he got extended. And then, of course, in 1910, the city administration extended for another 70 years, because originally it was supposed to be a very ugly structure and it was to be stripped down. And there were artists in Paris that had written to do that. But the important thing is that we need to look at multiple usage and different ways of doing things. Now, as uh, Jane just mentioned, so on one hand, India is the second largest uh, country in terms of the number of internet users, but India comes number one when it comes to the number of non-internet users in the, in the world. Okay, so th that's also a fact. Uh, as uh, you can say that many of the things uh, about India, whatever you say, even the exactly opposite is also uh, could be true. The last thing that I want to uh, say is this, that when we are talking about unlicensed spectrum, we must, and as users, as a, uh, uh, participants in this whole ecosystem, we must look at the three cardinal principles that were uh, enunciated way back when the Part 15 rules came in FCC. So those are non-exclusivity, non-interference, and non-protection. Now what it actually means is this. Suppose we are all walking in a corridor, okay? So non-exclusivity is that not only I can walk, everybody else can walk, and everybody has that right. That's the non-exclusivity. The second is non-interference. If I'm walking, I should not be try, trying to disturb others who are also using the same space. And the third is non-protection. While we are walking, yes, it may ha happen that there's a crowd in between. I may have to stop for some time. It may happen that somebody may get a little bit of a, a speed may come down, or you may get a little bit of a physical blockage and things like that. We have to sustain and absorb and adopt and respect all those things. Because that's the value that we, these three values, I would say, are at the core of any unlicensed usage, but not just unlicensed usage, I will say any civil usage in terms of civility, uh, as a matter of civility uh, as human beings, I'm saying, uh, in, in terms of how we interact with each other. So, for example, if we have a Wi-Fi router, it doesn't mean that we have to transmit 36 dBm if that's what the regulations allow. If my work can happen with 16 dBm, it's okay. I should just do with 16 dBm so that there's opportunity for others also to use these things. And that's where it is very important for people to see that not necessarily you have to transmit at the highest power, which has been permitted by the regulators. Not only that you have to use all the bands that have been permitted by the regulators, try to do with as little power, with as little spectrum that we can, so that more and more people can use. And I think that's the way for us to connect uh, more and more people going forward. And I, as uh, Jane mentioned, uh, my day job is with Symantec. Uh, which is a cybersecurity company, and uh, my night job is with the IEEE because most of the calls and meetings uh, are in the night time for me, and uh, so I'm the global chair of the IEEE Internet Initiative. So all, all the Wi-Fi standards, if you see, so 802.11, A, B, G, N, A, X, 
uh, AY and all these alphabetical soup, or they are all based on IEEE standards. So uh, we continue to work on th those areas, and we do need to do these type of things, and also look at how do we use these things in a more secure uh, manner so that people also have uh, security and trust in these things. Thank you. Thank you. I know Steve and Carlos and Mike Jensen, who's, I don't know if Mike's here, no. When they were doing research on this paper, I got a, a ping from Carlos who said, it's impossible to find anything about Spectrum on the <laughs> websites. So unless, and I used to work at an agency, I didn't do the Spectrum work at NTIA, would never claim that, not in a, not in a cold mm -hmm. second, but I used to work with a lot of the Spectrum engineers. And there are a lot of, there are 130 at least Spectrum engineers in one agency doing government Spectrum related work. So well, they're super focused on the work, it's hard to know exactly what they're doing sometimes, right? If you're a public person, you're a community network, you're trying to figure out how you get access. In the US, it would be the FCC, not, not the other agency. But Steve, what would you say about, or Carlos, how do normal community networks who are volunteer people, often on occasion, get access to data? What would you be your recommendations about what you would sell, say to government, like how to help them sort this out? Um, my recommendation would be to follow a well-established tradition now of transparency and open data in government. Uh, the, the telecom sector is desperately overdue for transparency in not just spectrum assignments, but uh, the, where fiber networks are. Because if you're building a community network, the first thing you want to do is find access to a fiber network. And indeed, where towers are, because uh, you know, the mobile network operators claim um, coverage that is sometimes based on their desire to negotiate good roaming agreements uh, as opposed to um, uh, truth in advertising. And, and so the ability to actually validate um, claims as we try and connect everyone. So um, those, those three things could be part of an open data policy that could easily just bring telecom infrastructure into broader overall open data. Can I carry on? Absolutely. <laughs> so, there, I, I, wanted to, um, I wanted to address a question that was raised in the last session. Uh, the gentleman from India was asking, why don't, um, why don't community networks scale? And, and uh, I, I hope to explode that myth a little bit uh, uh, by saying that, uh, you know, um, scale is, is kind of like the, is a, the, the Silicon Valley end of the rainbow. And, uh, and, and I, I don't believe it's necessary. Uh, I mean, it, it's good in some circumstances and not in others. And I want to illustrate it with a, uh, with a metaphor. Um, if, you, if you took a glass jar uh, and you were trying to fill that jar with sort of fist-sized stones, um, you could fit maybe three or four stones in that jar. And the, star, the jar would roughly look full. But if you fill that jar with water, it's actually still more than 50% uh, water. And that is roughly the state of telecom regulation. We regulate for these large stones, and it's never going to fill the jar, right? We need regulation for, for these sort of, you know, pebbles, and indeed for sand. Uh, and that's the only way we're actually going to achieve 100% connectivity for everyone. So uh, in order to... Um, to achieve uh, universal access, it's not that we need one giant community network. We need a million community networks, just like we have a billion Wi-Fi devices. That I mean, nobody nobody talked about building. How do we scale? You know, to a you know a national Wi-Fi? No, it, it grew much more organically, and so. I think, you know, creating regulatory frameworks that accommodate big stones, small stones, and sand is actually the strategy we need. And indeed, this is what uh, Carlos and Sean Pather and I have been pursuing in a recent submission to the, uh, the South African government uh, on the disposition now of 800 megahertz and 2.6 gigahertz spectrum there, is trying to open up these opportunities for these, these, uh, these smaller regulatory interventions that are small but can have massive, massive impact. Okay, I think, yes, before, before maybe uh, the other panelists actually get to, get to speak and 
we would like to hear from the floor and to take some some questions. So Hans, uh, we're going to take like four, let's say. One, two, Maritz, ah, no, Nico, and over there, uh, that's five. OK, five. OK, so we'll start, Roger, then maybe in the next iteration. So Don, please, we go that way. Thank you. Uh, picking back up on Steve's first point about the wall that's created by the values of, of spectrum licenses, um, there have been a lot of proposals and advocacy around different things that regulators should do, but uh, the business interests of the providers seem to prevail in most regulatory environments, that not many regulations are implemented that are opposed by the predominant carriers uh, and who uh, are able to uh, take uh, liberties with alternative business models, anything that might possibly threaten their own returns on investments, they simply oppose, not necessarily because it will, because it just might. So my question is, uh, rather than try to convince regulators, how do we convince the holders of these valuable licenses which have more success convincing regulators about uh, policy than people or want more for everybody? Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna take the the, the, the benefit of being a, moder a moderator. Uh, in South Africa, in rural areas, there is 900 and 1800 spectrum that is empty, unused. I've been monitor. I, I I have monitored the spectrum. I have proved that is unused. I've approached those operators, and they say no. And there is nothing that the government or the regulator can do. They say no. Period. It's a policy decision to actually enforce those type of use it or share it. That is what we have put forward in this new submission with new spectrum licenses, then enforce use it or share it from the beginning. Because if not, those those might are going to be, well, ma ma I might use it in 2057. Well, whatever. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Continue there. Yeah, the gentleman with. We just need you to use a microphone because it's being live uh, streamed. Right. Uh, thank you. Uh, I actually wanted to touch upon uh, another problem that is, well, it's not a new problem, but still ever existing, and that is uh, cross-border interference. I mean, uh, one country can decide indeed to allocate additional spectrum for mobile broadband, but if there is a neighboring country that uses it, I. I don't know, for TV broadcast or sometimes military purposes or whatnot, it will be a huge, well, depending on geography and... See, exactly, already uh, interference. So basically, well, depending on geography and let's say if one country is small or big, uh, then it can be actually a very huge problem. Well, we know eventually these things are sorted out and some harmonization decisions are made, but still it sometimes takes a lot of time and during which the either you cannot use the spectrum or you can use it only partially. So do you have any suggestions on these kind of situations? How can we improve the cross-border coordination? Thank you. I'm also going to take a small prerogative. There are commissions that are set up in over borders. There are commissions between countries that are often set up to handle these disputes and or not a dispute, but a happy thing. So Steve is from Canada and I'm from the United States. The FCC and the Canadian regulator have had a 40 year old uh, cross border commission, same with Mexico, where um, Eric is from. And when the US was changing from um, analog to digital TV, you can imagine what that did for the border areas, yeah? So Mexico and Canada moved faster to change over, but the key thing was they worked with each other for years in discussions. So this also touches upon one of the biggest problems in the world right now, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa and in, a, in Central Asia, is cross-border connectivity. If you don't talk to each other, those problems are going to continue. And I live, I've lived in two landlocked countries where this was a huge issue. Power levels will be turned up on the borders on purpose to mess around with the spectrum in the other country. So the question is, sometimes this is where we need governments to come together with industry and others, our organizations to say, if you care about connectivity, which equals socioeconomic development, then you've got to find a way forward. 
So I'm going to, who's next on the question? But this is a really good question, and thank you for no, answering just, it. Just to come in, Since, just uh, a quick, quick one. Since you mentioned Sub-Saharan Africa. Yeah, yeah, now, we, from the African point of view, we, we, we have set up um, parameters through which this kind of interferences should be avoided. Uh, that one thing. And we have uh, the policy of uh, harmonization of the user spectrum uh, across the continent. Now, the challenge is all these rules are there, this mechanism is there, but enforcement is still uh, to, yet to be, uh, uh, to be implemented. Uh, I'm Siva Subramanian from Internet Society India, Chennai. One of the reasons why a community network should scale is to get past the situation where uh, smaller community networks have to get uh, the bandwidth from telecom companies. I, I understand that you can also get bandwidth or uh, from captive bandwidth from IXPs, but uh, in some cases uh, the situation is that you have to go to a telecom company to set up a community network. And the other reason is that, uh, as he was talking about uh, the ability of telecom companies, large telecom companies, to have a voice and regulation when community networks scale, they do have a, the ability to have a voice as much as a telecom company has. And so these are the two reasons. And I actually wanted to ask a question to Jane. What are the countries that have exemplary policies and spectrum regulations? Which are the countries that have opened up spectrum space or uh, broadened uh, their policies? And uh, would those countries share their uh, rationale with other countries so that uh, such a practice and such good practice becomes universal. After all, uh, the, there was so much talk about uh, the revenue from spectrum being so high. And is it really high? Is 50 or $60 billion uh, <coughs> some of any significance to I'm United States? Yes <laughs> we are talking about people with $1 dollar a day. Yeah. And I would actually suggest Dale Hatfield. Uh, can you raise your hand, Dale? Dale is one of the most preeminent experts in, in lots of different aspects of teaching, harmonize everything at the FCC. So I would say Dale might be a person for you to talk to. I'm not going to put Dale on the spot right now. But who's the next question? Sorry. Ah, Sorry. bravo. So we can put Dale on the spot. Mm -hmm. But I would say quickly, so countries we know about, Argentina, Brazil, Mexico, Colombia, uh, forget South the Africa. South Africa, um, Georgia. So there's a, quite a range, and Steve may be able to help you later with some more that are in the study. Uh, but Dale, over to you. You had a question. I, I don't think I can directly uh, comment on what was just being said, but I wanted to raise uh, three points. Uh, one, too much of our work is based upon worst case interference situations where you assume that there's going to be a disaster and that there's very high probability and therefore you incumbents tend to claim it that causes the spacing to go out a lot further than it should be and uh, my colleague uh, Pierre de Vries has been advocating something risk-informed interference analysis where you really look if this interference occurs is it really going to do any any harm that we worry about the second, I think, still to this day, uh, we don't remember, everybody in this room knows, but we can have billions of transmitters on the air. They don't interfere with each other. It's only when you put the first receiver out there. So a lot of the problem is here is on the receiver side, and receiver technology has not, well, I wouldn't say it hasn't kept up, but we don't focus enough on receivers because the root of a lot of these problems is the receiver doesn't have adequate uh, performance. And then third is just a warning that's been concerning me recently. I love this notion. I've spent my whole life, I started as a ham radio up here. I love, I love, uh, I love radio, but we gotta remember, I think, that radio is an inherently open system. You can't put a Faraday cage around a radio to isolate it and expect it to work. It doesn't. It's inherently open. And therefore, we, I think, need to think more about jamming, spoofing, and those kinds of activities and the enforcement that goes with it. Otherwise, we're going to build a society built uh, uh, radio networks built upon, built upon something that can be uh, uh, 
hurt pretty badly by uh, people who are malicious actors wanting to uh, wanting to jam or spoof what we're doing. So, so we have four more uh, hands up. That's uh, Raúl, Nico, Roger, and Peter. Uh, please, super precise. We, we are running out of time, and then we would like to get something from the from the panelists as well. So, maybe Raúl first, but one minute, please. Like, try to keep it short. Sorry. <laughs> I will take over the mic of the of our star. <laughs> um, no, just, uh, in fact, it's related with uh, something that you asked, uh, Carlos, and and Siva t uh, touched upon that. Uh, you said, uh, "Why we don't do that?" Uh, if everybody agrees. Um, <coughs> So I, I was thinking that's uh, the, m my personal experience in the talking with government and when we met in, uh, in Argentina for WTDC, that <coughs> talking individually with many governments, uh, and private sector companies, even many telcos, everybody was um, uh, sensitive to this, uh, but in a positive way. That's, uh, they, um, uh, they agreed with the principles that we were promoting, that the, the regulatory and legal framework should be a catalyzer for, for connectivity and not an obstacle and uh, but uh, the problem is that when they um, get all together inside of the room and they are afraid of uh, being uh, um, too innovative and uh, so they are not uh, willing to take the risk and I think that's the the way to solve that is what you are doing here uh, and it's very good to have uh, Agustin Garzón from Argentina here that's uh, and have Mokhtar because though they are the people that will uh, show uh, together with the government of Georgia and Mexico and many others they will show to the rest of the world how things can be done uh, without hurting anybody without hurting private sector without hurting uh, investment uh, just uh, but um, allowing to build a, a very enabler environment uh, to connect the, the unconnected people. I think this is what we have to do, to continue uh, good, um, so having good experiences and showcasing the good experiences in order to motivate other governments that and private sector that probably are afraid, um, that's unnecessarily afraid of uh, innovating. Thank you. Okay, I took some notes about things that I think are dangerous to to uh, install as truths. Um, one of them is this uh, idea that uh, incumbents or big companies always have more power uh, regarding regulation and why should the dark side as some people uh, call them have more power uh, this is one point one important point because regulation is there to guarantee the rights of the people and to defend those that have less power in the society so if we are considering as a truth that those in, who have the power, the economic power, have the power to regulate, then we are doomed. Uh, another thing I consider uh, not good is to say that the next 3.5 billion people will be connected through mobile networks uh, directly th to their devices. Uh, this is not only said here, it's said in many different places. Uh, that, from our perspective, that is not the Internet that we want. We want people co-creating the Internet. We don't want people accessing a concentrated Internet. So that's another thing that's uh, dangerous. And a third thing, uh, I have more, but I will uh, finish here, is um, when we say the state loses lots of income if you don't uh, sell spectrum, the truth is that spectrum is paid always paid by the users. Yes, companies are uh, always having their users pay that cost. And users are not only paying the cost of spectrum, but also the financial cost of that. Yes, because companies have big financial cost to pay for that spectrum. So uh, you are actually transferring all of that to the users when we shouldn't. Thank you. 
So. Okay. Roger, can you be brief, please? Yes, I'll try. Uh, it was interesting when you said that uh, uh, the the uh, when you said that uh, the uh, the allocation of spectrum should not be bind to technology. So an allocation is an allocation for two, three G, LTE, etc. This is breaking the net, uh, the neutrality. That's okay. The question is if that it doesn't break the neutrality when we talk or discriminate between rural and urban. Uh, I'm saying so because this has been used, in, 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 at least in our case, to uh, harm us. We, we were said, as long as you stay rural, do whatever you, do, you, you want. Do, de develop your network community there. But when we started uh, getting into the urban areas, and especially when we started uh, dealing, playing with fiber, then the, 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 the attacks got higher and higher. And here, and I'm concluding, uh, if we are marginalized, even from the policy perspective, we will never reach the, uh, the, the size, the minimum size to be uh, sustainable, and then we cannot evolve. Thank you, Roger. Peter. Yeah, Nico, why should both of you took most of my points. Uh, I was just going to say, I think we get stuck a lot of times in this sort of either or, like it can only be this way or it can only be that way. And I think that it can be both at the same time. And so we're doing a lot of work in Mexico. So we have spectrum set asides for rural areas. Uh, we have a guaranteed right to spectrum as community networks. And that hasn't reduced or in any way affected the investment in large networks. Those guys are still building their networks. They're still doing whatever. So I don't. It's sort of like the regulatory space is a space of capture. That's kind of how it's always been treated. Um, and I don't think we need to continue um, strengthening that, that viewpoint. We need to break that down and break it apart and figure out how other people can enter into the space. Um, a lot of times folks from communities say, I would like to build a network, and they just they can't do it. They're not allowed. There's no space within the regulation to even begin to do that. So we need to start from there. Uh, and say other people should have the ability to to do these activities. It's as basic as that. So we'd like to give each of our roundtable panelists uh, a final word. So Steve, we'll start with you and go around the room to Mokhtar, Augustin, and, and with Pepper. Okay. Uh, this is for everyone in the room, and in particular anyone watching on the internet. Uh, the Teachable moments in your countries are the moments when regulators offer consultations, right? When they, when they issue a call for input on their licensing strategy, on their regulation strategy, it's complex, it's difficult, it takes a lot of getting to know. There are people in this room, we want to help you. Right? We want to assist you in that process. So reach out to us, uh, our, name, our names are here, and, and we'll help you. Uh, from uh, African Union perspective, a uh, few recommendations uh, for everybody uh, who is actually managing the spectrum. Set um, modest prices for the spectrum, prioritize the allocation and assignments, both of them, help operators, including community uh, operators, to mitigate the risk of uh, 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 implementing their network, and specifically adopting a long-term vision for the spectrum. Now, I, uh, we, the African Union, are starting already uh, this month a uh, 5 million euro project with ITU <laughs> to uh, address this issue of uh, model management of network. We hope all this has been said here will be factored, and we hope that we will end up with something that uh, could serve all the community. Now, with regard to specifically to the community network, there is a resolution of the WTDC uh, 17 that probably if we read it very positively, we can actually help the network to uh, move forward. Thank you very much. Um, I want to, see, to say two things. Uh, the, the first one is about the spectrum. Um, I think that we, as government, we need to think um, one framework for rural areas and small cities and another to big cities with big companies and uh, that makes us absolutely different uh, ways to approach that that uh, that issues 
And the second one is what I say, what, what Roder says about flexibility and open mind to, to get to everywhere with the, the best solution. Could be a spectrum, could be um, fiber optics, satellite internet. Um, but in big countries, that, as Argentina, we, we have to be, we have to work that way to, to connect fast, the, the faster way, everybody. So three quick things. Number one, uh, Steve, you mentioned about database. So India is the first country in the world where the data for 600,000 plus all the, every mobile tower and every antenna on the tower in terms of who the operator is and which band, whether it's 2G, 3G, 4G, et cetera, that data is available on a map in a public domain, okay? So that's one, I'll share the details with you later, that's one. Second thing is uh, uh, we need to just, just to look at the size of the Wi-Fi economy itself. As for the Wi-Fi Alliance, for this year, the Wi-Fi economy, if, had it been an independent country, it would be the ninth largest economy in the world at 1.96 trillion, close to Italy's uh, GDP. And the 2023 projection is 3.47 uh, trillion. So it's pretty huge in that sense. Uh, uh, that's the second thing. And the third thing is, uh, within IEEE, as we continue to uh, advancing technology for humanity, uh, we are also looking at uh, how do we uh, bring in uh, security and privacy by design as well as by default while making these type of uh, decisions. Thank you. Um, I will come with the first question oh, you made, and on how we we don't. Uh, wh how do we do not to feel to threaten the actual uh, operators? And well, the thing is that they will always feel threatened. Huh? <laughs> yeah, and I, I work for the industry, and in my when I, I started, and and I uh, I remember I've been negotiating law for certain acts for the from the industry, and. Uh, and even in things that they were not dang on danger for them, or they would be beneficial for them, they would oppose. No? But that's what I think it's very important, the position of the government. And they have its own position, different from the, uh, probably from the users, different from the regulator, a point in the middle that says, I know that this is going to be good for the market, this is going to be good for the competition. and. Uh, and I think we are living that example in Mexico. When we get this, at the beginning we asked uh, one of the companies for use of the spectrum, they didn't want it. Now that this regulation has come over, two of the biggest operators approach to us and say, how can we work with you? Can we, do you want us to, to help you in a certain way? Because more users are always better than non-users at all. No, at the end, these people rings to each other, rings to people that are in another network, so the market gets benefit. But it's important that the regulators stand in the best benefit for the people and for the market itself. So not to protect the industry, not to try to protect them, because at the end, if you try to protect the, uh, the operators, you are acting against the industry. And that's very important that a regulator stands, stands for, the, for the industry, stands for the, mer the market, stands for the users, and not for a specific for protecting the operators. So, yeah, I, I, I completely agree with that. In fact, um, it's consistent with what I was going to say, which is, you know, one of the successful things about spectrum policy is focusing on competition, not competitors. Right, so the market needs, and w w because empirically, what we have seen is that when markets get opened up and there are new entrants, um, we've seen investment innovation. I mean, uh, you can just go back to all of the naysayers that said that um, Wi-Fi would never work, Part 15 would never work, um, right? The the world would end. Um, of course, that never happened. Um, uh, and so it's actually about aligning incentives. So I think, you know, f again, focusing on end, end use. It goes back to the other thing I said, which is, um, uh, you know, where spectrum is, even if it's been assigned, but it's not being used, that's where the, the, new, t the new techniques for opportunistic use um, of, of sure. dynamic sharing, right? And going back, Deepak, to your point, which is, you know, it's it's not no protection, no interference, right? And there are ways to do that. 
Yeah, I mean, I think that that actually is, is great because that also, that, that begins to attack some of the scarcity things. Um, and, uh, you know, Nico, I actually ag agree with two of the, your three points, but I, I think maybe you misunderstood what I was saying. Um, what, I use the phrase wireless, not mobile, because, right, which is important. Nobody here in this room is connected through Ethernet. Um, we're all, our devices are connected through wireless, but the first thing that happens when it hits the access point, it goes into a fixed network. So I used to uh, uh, joke about um, when mobile operators were talking about their mobile networks, I would say, I have no idea what you're talking about. No idea. In fact, there's no such thing as a mobile network. The network does not move, um, except maybe a mobile satellite. Right? The reality is we're talking about wireless links into fixed and you need really robust, good, open backhaul right? from the point of the access point. So again, I, I think if you think, I agree with you, you, don't, you, we don't want the world to be exclusively connected through traditional mobile operators, although they're going to do maybe 70% of that. But, the, but what's going to discipline the market is if there's the ability for people to compete with them on the 70% and then fill in. This is the sand that fills in around, right, the big, the, the big rocks uh, to fill in the remaining um, 30%. And so it's, it's, it's not an either or, right? Sometimes we get trapped in, in false choices. What we need to do is use every technique possible at our disposal in all different ways, licensed, unlicensed, opportunistic, dynamic, to get the spectrum out there, reduce the scarcity, and get service to people, right? And then afterwards, we can talk to Matt, because Matt's done some amazing things, <laughs> well, seriously, in, in, in areas that people said would never get connectivity, ever, right? In Native American um, uh, uh, lands uh, in the US um, and for indigenous people. So I think there's a, I'm really optimistic that if we do this right, we can actually close that gap. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. I think uh, when, we, when we first started discussing about this paper, it was about opening up a conversation that was totally closed. I think this conversation is opening up, having all of you here, from panelists to, to audience, to the people on the internet, discussing and, and, and thinking and, and considering these new options about how a, a resource that is not being used efficiently can be used better to to connect the unconnected and to provide universal affordable access. I think we've done a great, a great step. And thank you, Isaac, for the, for the support. And, and, uh, and yeah, I, I think uh, the, the goal has been achieved. I think it's, I don't have my, budget, my magic ballot in terms of what is the next step, but I think the next step is in each of every one of us to take this conversation forward in our, in our constituencies, in our countries, in our policy and regulatory frameworks, and as Steve was saying, use every single opportunity if we do believe that this is the way forward to actually act in every single window that opens for us to influence it in such a way. So thank you very much for listening, for participating, and for engaging.